afternoon's conversation builds on the morning's conversation on financing for inclusion. And we're now looking at using the business platform to advance equality, diversity, and inclusion. Natalie Jabangwe, who joins us from Zimbabwe, has said, I want to be remembered as a great contributor to the economic development of nations and champion in, the, in developing the potential of others. So I love the juxtaposition of seeing yourself as an agent of change in rebuilding nations such as Zimbabwe in post-conflict and other parts of Africa, but also seeing yourself as a role model and as a mentor to all of those whom you champion in developing their potential. So thank you. Thank you for that wonderful summation of the human spirit. So apart from the fact that you're the youngest FinTech CEO in Africa and the, and the only woman CEO of a FinTech in Africa, you're also a lover of Shakespeare. You're a lover of the Bard and that's what you bring to your work as a fintech entrepreneur and CEO. And you have often quoted to me um, the Bard's words, needs must from Richard II, which says it is a compelling force. You're compelled to remake Zimbabwe because what else can you do as a woman leader? It is a compelling force. So what I want you to do today is to talk about some of the stories that you've shared with me about how your company, EcoCash, this mobile money financial inclusion company has helped rebuild Zimbabwe because 80% of Zimbabwe's money is invested in EcoCash, but you've also touched the lives of the woman who is selling fruit in the marketplace in Zimbabwe. So you've empowered this woman with a basket of fruit on her head, as well as reshaped the nation of Zimbabwe, bringing together your mission of doing both as a contributor to the economic development of nations and to developing the potential of others. Natalie? Rangita, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here in this forum today. Uh, it is always a great delight to come here on your platform and share with uh, young and upcoming global leaders who will do even more uh, than what you have described. Because when we have more of us as forerunners and forebearers, the world can only be better. But let me talk a little bit about our journey in building uh, EcoCash, a business which is now um, 10 years old, which we built bottom up. And we really uh, decided to build it because there was very little trust in Zimbabwe in the banking sector uh, post hyperinflation when the nation had crumbled economically in 2008. And people went back to mattress banking but what was even more detrimental was that at the time, only 10% of the population in Zimbabwe was banked. And so of that 10% that were banked, no longer trusted banks because of mismanagement and misgovernance. But thanks to the power of technology and telecommunications, we were looking at the trends that had happened in East Africa where M-Pesa had just started. And there were four runner in mobile financial services. They were there first. Uh, pretty much first mover uh, in the market of digital financial services and we call ourselves a fast follower. And so we put together this value proposition and figured that we could actually do better and learn more importantly from the people who had gone quicker and faster than us in the market to figure out how we can make it better for people in Zimbabwe. Within six months from only having 800,000 bank accounts in the country, we registered a million customers with mobile transacting wallets for the first time ever. And a story that really strikes me is a story that came out in the paper of a woman that was interviewed uh, who always used to go and give her paycheck to her husband. And as soon as she could get her own account on her mobile cell phone, her husband would really abuse her and say, give that money and he would control it. 
he said with, she said with great control and great empowerment, the money is on my cell phone and I cannot share my password. It was a very, very empowering moment. Fast forward a decade later, we have 11 million uh, banking wallets on our platform where cumulatively banks have 3.5 million accounts. We have also compelled the banks to be faster and quicker. They have learned of what we've been doing. It's been a systemic change. But however, what digitization has done is scale up to the point that we move 80% of the country's GDP on our platform. We've also been able to empower people that have small to medium enterprise and formal businesses who otherwise would never get credit, who otherwise would never have, um, would never have professional or would never have uh, formal uh, bank accounts. And today they can actually run their businesses on the platform. They can use data to figure out who their customers are and they can use their platform to communicate with people all throughout the country. And so we've solved for economic growth a very, very important SDG. We have solved for equality because at least today, 35% of, of people that transact on our platform are women from a place where 10 years ago, we only had 3% of women transacting on the platform. We are looking to double this number so that by 2023, we have at least 65% of all women in this country transacting on the platform. As far as our story goes, we are pleased that we did in Zimbabwe what banks couldn't do in 100 years, we've been able to do in three years typically where we got our scale. And far and large, we've been able to touch a diversity of industry sectors and value chains, and value chains that range from manufacturing uh, and go through to wholesale services and go through to mining and agriculture. All of these converge on the platform. And this is what has given the network effect. And we're truly grateful for the power of technology that has enabled us to go faster and quicker than we otherwise would have been able to in least developed nations. If there was ever a story of how business can be a platform for nation building and individual empowerment, including addressing issues of violence against women, it is your story of building EcoCash to do that dual purpose of both nation building and addressing women's empowerment. Thank you, Natalie, for everything you continue to do and the challenges that you continue to face in a COVID world where your, your work is even more important in addressing some of the ways in which the gender divide has been exacerbated. So Amy Weaver, my dear and admired friend, is the president of Salesforce and the chief legal officer. But she's much more than that. As I mentioned earlier in the afternoon, we think of leadership in terms of those who Joseph Nye, the former dean of, of uh, the Kennedy School has said, it's not about having a title. A title gives you a fishing license, but does not give you the fish. Amy Weaver has bought the license to fish because she has a title, but she does much more with the title. She is remaking the world. She's using the platform of Salesforce to advance gender equality and other forms of equality. So Amy Weaver, just to give you two examples and two stories from her life, with the active support of her CEO, Mark Benioff, she opposed a bill in Georgia that many believed would legalize discrimination against LGBTQ. Recently, again, with the active support of Mark Benioff, she supported Prop C, which would increase corporate tax on some of the largest companies in San Francisco as a way to address permanently the problem of homelessness. So those are two stories of many stories of Amy Weaver using Salesforce as a business platform to do social good. So Amy, can you speak about the ways in which under your leadership, under the leadership of your CEO, you no longer see this binary choice between making profit versus promoting the public good? 
they are both merged. The public good is part of doing well and doing good. And it is really the right thing to do as well as a business imperative. And just recently, the Business Roundtable had a shift in their philosophy from Mark Friedman's understanding of business as solely for profit making to a great, an understanding of the greater good of, uh, of the public. So there is this understanding that shareholder profit now needs to give way to stakeholder empowerment. And if any company does live up to those ideals, it's sales force under your leadership. Amy? Well, Rankita, it's great to see you. It's the first time I've had a fishing license uh, be part of my introduction. So I think I'm going to insist on that always going forward. Um, so as Rangita said, I, I think there's been a real shift in terms of how we look at what the basic purpose of a corporation is. And as I've talked about with Rangita before her, some of her classes, I remember being sitting in my uh, Harvard Law School corporations class. This was way back in the 90s and talking about what was the, what was the purpose of a corporation? What was the obligation of a corporation to the community where it was based? Now, this was, you know, mid early uh, 1990s. It was a very liberal classroom. But even then, there was a huge debate. And the very conservative students said there was absolutely no obligation for a corporation to do anything for its community. I mean, don't do any harm, but no obligation. And then the very liberal students all argued, yes, there was an obligation. And when pushed on it, they said, you know, they should give to the local little league or maybe the ballet. That was all they could see of the power of the corporation. And looking back, I mean, not only am I struck by the incredible lack of imagination of a bunch of 20 year olds, but we were also wrong. We were wrong, I think, both legally and ethically. I think the duty of our of a corporation is to have a long term successful entity. And that's one that is also making returns back to its shareholders. But the way to do that that has become so clear is by using the business as an opportunity to focus on good and focus on all of our stakeholders. And just briefly, you know, um, Rangeta mentioned uh, our CEO, Mark Benioff, and he had a real vision for this. So the day, the, literally the day the company was incorporated back in 1999, he committed that uh, to what we call the 111. And that meant that 1% of the equity, 1% of employee time, and 1% of our product would always go to good causes. And he loves to joke that that really didn't mean that much because they had no employees, no product, and equity wasn't worth anything. But 21 years later, this is a $242 billion mar market cap company. We have spent our, uh, millions of hours of employee time, 50,000 nonprofits running on our system, either free or discounted amounts. And we've given away about $300 million in grants. So this idea of starting small, embedding these ideas right into the heart of your company, I think it's just unlimited what you can do. Wonderful, I love that one, one, one ideal. And those are the kinds of lessons that I want to take out of this forum that could be then help to shape the ways in which other businesses remake our world in a post-COVID world. So Joshua, Joshua Bixby is the CEO of Fastly. And again, this is a story of a allyship because it was David Hornick who introduced you to me. And David has been such a huge ally of everything that I do. So I wanted to, 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 to be able to acknowledge the, the importance of allyship and the importance of building relationships. So Joshua, as the CEO of Fastly, your role has been to empower developers. And you have said recently in Mad Money that we stand by the best of the web and that we stand by developers and innovators. So my question to you is that in a changing world, especially post Black Lives Matter, how do you empower underrepresented uh, minority developers? How do you go out of your way to fund and nurture those developers who are Black, who don't maybe look like you? 
Thank you for having me here. And it's an honor to be on uh, this panel. Uh, as you said, David has been uh, an ally to many, myself included, and I feel very humbled to uh, have him as uh, the lead director on my board. Uh, I continue to learn from him. I think, and it's interesting what Amy said, and I, and, I, and I could not agree more, it comes back to this foundational thought of what are we here for? And we look at, we believe we're here to provide value back to society. And I think one of the things that has coalesced for us is that by mandating that employees keep politics, activism, and all their personal beliefs completely out of the workplace, I think leaders ensure that many people, but really particularly members of historically underrepresented groups, silently bear this tremendous weight alone. So by saying, I don't see it, um, it doesn't mean the problem isn't there, it means that you don't see it and you're not actively engaged. So I believe, you know, we are on a journey to try um, to empower, as you said, developers. But I, I, I would, there's one twist to that. It's not all developers because we have a good neighborhood policy and we think as a company, we have the right to determine who uses our software and who doesn't. So I actually think part of the answer to your question is actually in making decisions, active decisions about who your clients are. If your clients are people who are oppressors, then how can you go and recruit and have people in your company that feel proud to build a product if the product that is, being, is then being used to, for hate or violence against their communities? So I actually think, and I, and I feel like this, particularly as a white male leader, whatever words I say have very little impact um, in, in, in terms of engendering confidence that I am actually an ally. It's actually the actions. And so I think understanding this is about the behaviors and the actions. So I think the start of your question is, to me, you need to have people, but also customers that represent the viewpoints of allyship, uh, anti-violence, anti-racism. It starts there. And then I think to your question of how do you get more, this is about, and the earlier panel talked a lot about this, this is about funding at all parts of that process um, from the grassroots where we're providing funding. Um, I never feel like it's enough, but you know, we just announced $50 million of services to organizations that support these viewpoints. Um, and it's about creating an internal culture where you actually are doing what you say and that really understand the tremendous emotional weight that is put on historically underrepresented groups and being able to have that discussion and then build out the frameworks. One of the things that I am sick of saying uh, as a leader of a very fast growing business is we're early in the journey. I hate that. I, I, want, it, I want us to be the leader and we aren't there yet. Uh, and, and so I don't wanna represent us as anything that we aren't. I, 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 the aspiration is there, the goal is there, the leadership is there, but we haven't, um, achieved what I believe we can achieve. Uh, and that um, either can make you very sad every day when you come to work as a leader, or it can inspire you. And for me, I'm inspired to make tomorrow better than yesterday. And there's a lot of tomorrow that can be better than yesterday at this point. Joshua, every time I listen to you, I feel so uplifted and elevated because you bring so much energy and inspiration to the room. So I want to take some uh, some of what you've said, what Amy does in her everyday life, and turn to Rene. In looking at how can we use business as a platform, as a tool to root out systemic racism and systemic sexism. So Rene, you problematized a challenge that I shared with you the last time we met when you spoke to my class. I spoke about something that Hillary Clinton recently wrote up in the Atlantic, quoting from some of the work that Harvard Kennedy School has done on blind resumes, on blind auditions. And you said, no, you don't want to be blind. You want to have your eyes wide open, you said, when you were reviewing these resumes so that you could pick out the best and the most diverse team. And I thought that was so interesting because to some extent, it went against conven new conventional thinking. It went against the new orthodoxy of blind auditions. And Rene, I need to confess, after you made that comment, I did go back and look at your, looked at your board. 
And I found that true to what you said, it was extremely diverse. You probably had one or two white men. The rest were all women and people of color. So you stood by what you said when you said that you want to, you want to select and retain people with your eyes wide open. So can you speak to that? And just for those who don't know, Rene, Rene is the founder of Bill.com, which is one of the most important uh, uh, mechanisms in a paperless economy in a COVID and post-COVID world. But SMEs are your constituency. And the small and medium-sized enterprises are, correct me if I'm wrong, are mainly run and led by women. So, you know, your constituents are mainly women entrepreneurs. So I think you can speak to this issue of diversity in a way that is not just theoretical or abstract, but is a daily dynamic in your leadership. Well, thank you, Brandita, for having me. And, and like all the other speakers have said, it's, it's a great honor to be here talking about this. This is an important, really important discussion. It's an important uh, focus area I think that all business leaders need to have, which is how do you make sure you have a diverse environment to bring out the best in people? Uh, if I just step back before answering your question, the, the reason I like diversity uh, is because uh, group think is bad. And a bunch of white dudes thinking about talking about something isn't gonna get the best ideas. And it's because they all have similar experiences or more similar experiences, but getting people from different experiences in different parts of the world, different ways of life, different class systems, even their upbringing, all that creates better ideas about how to serve the broader market. So it's good for business. Uh, it's also a ton more fun to be a part of a diverse team. So, you know, to your question and your point around, you know, being eyes wide open, um, I would say for me, I've always, because of this desire to not have group think be something that holds back my leadership or my, my growth in the company, I've always had an, you know, uh, I would say an unbiased approach to hiring. But there come times when you kind of step back and you look and say, well, how are we doing? Um, and in particular, when I was hiring some executives a couple of years ago, uh, I had said to the recruiters, hey, I want, I want to continue the diversity that we have and I need to make sure that we're getting there. And I had three recruiters I was working with. Two of them, they brought lots of diversity. They got that. One of them did not. It was all white men that were coming through on that particular position. And it was in talking with some of the board members that they suggested that, hey, you know, why don't you just tell the recruiter that you want to have 60, 70% of the resumes, not the hiring, you're still gonna hire the best person, but just get 60 to 70% of the resumes being of a diverse pool. Um, and that became a very powerful tool because that actually changed the recruiter's actions. It changed how they started thinking about it. They realized it meant something to me that it was really critical. And that allowed me in that position to get somebody that was a non-white male that I thought was great for the, you know, for the role. So, you know, when I step back and look at the company, you know, where we're at today across the entire company is we've got 67% uh, are non-white. 43% uh, are female. And uh, of the independent directors, you're correct, three are women, two are white males. One of them's an African American woman. And so, you know, as I move the VCs off, you know, then we'll get more, continue to get more diversity. And it, you know, we just had our first board meeting with that set of, you know, people. And it was by far the most engaged board meeting because, again, it was the different experiences that all of them brought. So, you know, I, I don't think we can underestimate or understate this enough that you have to have a purpose. You have to have a focus around having diversity. And if you're not getting the quality of the candidates in that you want to make sure you're hiring at the right level, then you just got to work harder and ask for it because there are great, really talented people out there that uh, are diverse. You don't have to, to just take the easy path because I think your last session, you know, we were talking about uh, the number of of business school candidates that were, were, were men still compared to women. You, you don't have to, you know, there are plenty of great candidates. So I think having folks and intention always makes a difference in whether it's your hiring practice or your goals or your focus or your philanthropy, all that intention makes a difference. 
So, you know, we've been talking about purpose-driven business and how business is no longer, the purpose of business is no longer only profit making, but there's a higher model purpose that Mark Benioff, Amy Weaver, CEO at Salesforce has so profoundly made it clear that there is, that there is this purpose that drives the best businesses and the best businesses thrive on a purpose because it's very much driven by not only the, the, the shareholders and the stakeholders, but the people whom you hire. The best talent want that purpose to animate their daily work. So Conrado, as um, someone who, who came to the United States from Latin America, you are the managing partner of Linklaters, and you bring that kind of ethos, not only of diversity, but also the importance of bringing a global perspective to American business. Can you speak a little bit about your own work, Conrado, and your leadership? Yeah, sure. And first of all, um, good, whatever it is, afternoon, morning, or whatever is applicable um, to everyone. I'm, I'm humbled to be here and uh, very proud. But uh, look, I, I think um, uh, I would say that uh, I never thought of myself as diverse until uh, my firm asked me to go to Madrid, Spain. I'm from origin from Argentina. And uh, I was basically, I was a partner then, and then I got into a meeting room and, uh, and I asked, I was asked to be a diversity partner. And then I asked, how come? I mean, what, what how am I, how, how do I defer from these other gentlemen here? And, I, and then it was basically, I guess, my accent, uh, the fact that I wasn't, I wasn't from there, I was a foreigner. So I realized that diversity, there are many facets to diversity, that it's not one angle, so or one, one, one perspective only, and that you need to be aware of, of, of all those things, and typically you are not aware. So being self-conscious of your own limitations and diversity. So then uh, I went back to, I was asked to go back to New York and focus in Latin America, which is what I do, what I've been doing for the last 10 years, and I've been Trying, uh, I've been puzzled always by this uh, uh, uniformity in, 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 in the profession, in the legal profession, which I think, as Matt Nimitz was saying, it's perplexing because now law schools have fixed that. Uh, and basically, uh, and, and if you, it's more than 50% uh, of students, of law students are female. And actually, if you look at grades, I think we talk about this, Rangita, actually, you would have to hire at least 70% of, of, of women, just because of you, if you only were based on grades. So you need to be diverse to just make sure that you need to compromise on, on, uh, on grades or on, uh, uh, on, on academics just to have a diverse uh, group. So I was puzzled by that. And then I started basically challenging um, people because how come that we law firms, we get roughly about half of our uh, recruits being female, our first years, as we call them. And then when they go to partnership, I, we only have like 16%, 17%, which is average, actually, if you look at then sort of the directors in, in the uh, Fortune, I think, 500, et cetera, it's pretty much or Fortune 100. It's all the same, 17 16%, et cetera. So uh, when I go to meeting, uh, meetings with uh, partners meetings and we need to make a decision and say, well, what, what, are the, what is the talent that we're missing here? Because we clearly, uh, we are deprived of that and we sort of do it ourselves. So um, it's about um, trying to fix that. And then, I mean, I, I joined the 30% club, which is basically wants to try to have us in, in Europe is uh, mandated by law, by law but uh, in America and, and UK, I think the idea is to do it uh, more voluntarily, which I think it's, uh, it's, it's whatever works. But, uh, uh, and I remember that uh, the, the, the first meeting of the US 30% club in, 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 in New York was at uh, eight, a quarter to eight or 7.30 a.m., et cetera. So I told my wife, well, you know, I have to go to this meeting just to try to promote um, uh, diversity, et cetera. And then she said, well, you know what? That's the, I mean, she's a journalist. She works from home. We all work from home now, I guess. But uh, <laughs> she said to me, she said to me, well, you know, 
what is the, the thing that you usually do at that time? I said, well, I usually take the kids to school. Well, you know, that's the only thing where you basically, you help me. You could help me during the day because then you're going to, into work, et cetera. So we thought that by doing the meeting earlier or somebody thought that by doing the, the meeting earlier before work, that made it important and would allow people to, to, to come. But then I looked at, well, you know, it's not always like that. Maybe we should have done it at a different time. So let's not go with, I learned that we shouldn't go with the same structures we use for one problem to try to fix another one. So it's, um, it's uh, look, uh, we've been working. So it's not one size fits all. Um, in some countries in Europe, it may work with a uh, legal requirement and some others may not. But actually, even in those countries, if you look at Scandinavia, where the the gender diversity is almost 50-50 at the board level, if you look at the senior management level, again, 18% of women. So there is something there. And I think this pandemic is making us uh, being slightly more holistic than we were. There's something there we need to we need to challenge and we need to think differently and uh, I've been trying to um, to keep that message and to to whatever are our counterparts whatever our clients is that just to learn from them but also to challenge them and uh, uh, and uh, a, a very good thing has been said about what the purpose of corporation should be etc we have a role in society we all have and with a law firm companies like yours etc our university, we have a role, and uh, we need to we we need to be conscious of that role. So uh, I we... I love that I love that call to action that law firms and corporations have a role to play in in inclusion and diversity and equality and in remaking yeah. the world. So on that note, I think it is important for all of you to think that as leaders, you have a stake in the future and you leave behind a legacy. And that in 20 to 25 years time, future generations will look back on all of you and this moment in time of 2020 and say, what did you do? What have you done? And that promise that you are speaking about, this promise of inclusion needs to endure. So on that, my student questions, which I'm going to pose to each of you is, how best will you ensure that this moment will end you? Because you know, your companies and law firms and all industries are coming together to make pledges, but will they have enduring value? David Wilkins has often called it the action after the call. You know, after the call to action, what was the action that was really taken and how do we measure that action in 20 years time? So I want you to use a looking glass and see the future, but also look back and see how this moment can endure. And the second question is, are there any ways in which you can incentivize from a financial perspective, some of the steps you are taking to create a more inclusive uh, uh, business platform. So I'm going to start first with Natalie and then go around the room. Each of you will have three minutes to respond to both questions. Natalie? Thanks, Rangita. Uh, personally, you know that I've started a movement. I've put together an innovation hub uh, here in Africa that attracts uh, young people who are highly talented with entrepreneurial dreams uh, to help nurture those and create an environment and an ecosystem that nurtures those ideas into viable ventures. And hopefully using my partnerships and networks globally to be able to give future uh, business leaders the ecosystem support that they would require to make their dreams happen so that we can have a scaled effect. My view is that if out of our innovation hub, we can have even if it were just 10 other businesses that were bigger than EcoCash that we run today, we will have achieved a lot because then they would contribute over 80% of the GDP of least developed nations. But secondly, in our business, we're championing nano credit for small to medium enterprises. And we've just innovated what is the world's first digital only stock exchange using data for small to medium enterprises and 
profiling this data and allowing the capital markets are, and pension funds to come through and offer financing to these small to medium enterprises who otherwise would never had an opportunity are to be given loans and or credit in a traditional bank. And so for us, it's the ability to scale and to um, disrupt or to democratize access to credit and access to finance, and particularly looking at women who are at the sometimes lesser base of the pyramid and are otherwise ignored by their, or for their potential just because of gender, the prejudice of, de of, of gender. But the data and their capability comes out in their sales and can be seen on our platform. And using that data to make sure that they can be seen and they can go first is something that we're promising for the future to make a difference in creating wealth. So these are such innovative ideas that you've shared with us. The earlier uh, session also spoke about Ant Financial and the ways in which the bottom of the pyramid, women, especially women, uh, can get access to loans while not having to go through the formal banking process. And what you've taught is so important because it is, as you say, a more egalitarian, more democratic process of accessing funds and banking the unbanked, which is really the, the mission behind EcoCash. So thank you, Natalie. And I love the idea of the new apps for future entrepreneurs, because I know how passionate you are about empowering the, the entrepreneurs of the future. So Amy, I want you to speak because this is something that is so dear to you and your entire uh, mission is one about the next generation of law leaders in the law, next generation of leaders in business, and the ways in which you can use your platform to both diversi uh, to diversify the workforce, but also ways in which you can advance equality in a more systemic way. You know, I always tell you that I see you as, you know, as a, in politics, in public life because I want you to take all of what you've done in business to politics. And in this new moment in history of political transition, do you see yourself using the business platform to leverage public office in a way that you can, as you said, uh, Natalie, to scale up the work that you've been doing at Salesforce? Well, I love this. Now I've got fishing licenses and the possibility of political office all in one morning. So this is fabulous. Um, I'm going to have my mother rewatch this. Uh, I, I think when I looked at my career initially, when I was um, you know, growing up and entering my career, I thought I would do the traditional thing for a lawyer, which is you go to a law firm and you work for a period of time. And then after you've kind of established yourself and, you know, you get your children off to school, that is when you would move into the public sector and either working for a nonprofit or going into politics or running for office, because I saw it as so binary. There was the time where you did your career and then there was a the time where you did something good for the world. I think what is so incredible now is that those things have come together and you don't have to make that choice. And right now I find that business is truly, truly one of the most powerful agents for change. And it provides you a platform to do so much. And it was interesting. I was listening to um, a lecture this morning at the Milken Institute, and it was talking about a study that uh, they had done about what, what people thought about in 26 different countries. And just by a stroke of luck, they ran the survey in February, right before everything hit for most of the world. And then they ran it again in July. And one of the things that was most troubling was seeing the lack of confidence in government. One of the things that was most hopeful was the confidence in business and for business to come in in innovative ways to really lead and to make change. And that's what I'm really focused on right now. I think that there is an incredible opportunity for businesses to really lean into what I think is truly our obligation, um, legally and socially, to do. And this is the moment for it. And taking advantage right now of the incredible changes we have in the world, we've got to do, you know, people say, you know, how quickly can we get back to normal? 
we have to think about what parts of normal are worth actually getting back to and how we're using this to reset and to reset in a way that's actually positive and pulling people forward. And that's the opportunity we have right now. So I love the way in which you use the term obligation because David Wilkins writes about the obligation thesis of mm -hmm. law schools and law firms to be able to advance diversity, mm -hmm. especially in terms of empowering black lawyers and black business leaders. So that obligation thesis is really what you are getting at, that mm -hmm. do we have that role to play? And is that a thesis that should be part of our mission statement? Mm -hmm. So Rene, can you speak to that issue of the obligation thesis? Because I think that's very important that as a business platform, do you feel you have that obligation? Do you feel you have that role to play in a COVID and a post-COVID world in rebuilding a world that is more equal? I, absolutely. Um, you know, my own personal philosophy is that you need to leave the world better every day. And so whatever the interaction is, whatever <clears throat> uh, communication or service that you're building, it needs to do something to make the world better. I try to do that on a daily basis. And so I think one of the most important things for folks to think about is what is the most actionable thing you can do today? And for any business leader, it is to make sure that their workforce is diverse. It is to make sure that their boards are diverse. It's to make sure that they are able to be uh, you know, a leader and a role model for bringing the best talent in no matter what their, their uh, ethnic uh, <clears throat> or sexual orientation or gender is, right? All those things I think have to be super important and as leaders, if we can affect that locally, it makes a big difference globally. And I think it cascades out across lots of other businesses, right? It's not just the, the time that they're working for you at your company. It's when those people, those leaders leave and they go on to the next company. That's the cascading change that I believe is the obligation. That's something I know I can control. It's a lot harder to control things external. Uh, obviously, money and donations are a way to influence external factors. But as a leader in a company, we all have the responsibility, the capability, and the obligation to do something different. And I think that's, you know, to your point on obligation, I've always felt that, that this is just an opportunity to, for me to kind of say, hey, this is what I think is a good way to be and to learn and to grow. And if I believe that, then I have to hold myself accountable. And holding yourself accountable is one of the harder things in life, but it's also one of the more rewarding things when you get it done right. So Joshua, as you said, you don't like to think, you're, think of Fastly as an early stage company. And you should not because Fastly is doing so very well. And part of doing well is also about doing good. And that's what you have said. Doing well and doing good are inextricably interlinked. And you have committed now funds for Black Lives Matter and for more diversity. And you've increased that funding, you've increased the giving. So on that, what I want to ask you is, given the fact that less than 2% of venture capital go to early stage startups that are led by women or women owned, how do you see Fastly? Because I see Fastly as a platform for developers and innovators and entrepreneurs. Do you see that some of your, uh, some of what drives you will be also providing seed capital, nurturing, nurturance in different ways by providing the platform for women entrepreneurs and for minority entrepreneurs and business leaders? I do. And I think that that manifests, you know, I, I look at venture capital, it's a very specialized um, job. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't profess that Fastly or our business uh, are experts in that. But what we are experts at is delivering the world's best experiences and securing them. And when I think about the entrepreneurs that are coming up, they are thinking digital first. And so what that allows us to do is to help them with some re a really important part of of this digital transformation story. So we've committed, as you said, to providing funds, but more importantly, our own, you know, our own products and resources so that as those companies look to scale, we can help them scale. Because we're really about security and scale. I think when I look at why so many organizations need funding at those early stages, is when they hit these little markers of success but their site doesn't work or it's slow or it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't perform. So I actually think one of the areas 
we can really help, which we have, and we've just rolled out a new commitment for this is around uh, how much we're gonna support startups, particularly, as you said, startups that uh, maybe are um, female founded or uh, some underrepresented group. I really think what Amy said, and I just wanna sort of emphasize this because it really stuck with me. I think a lot of people think of their career, particularly with our, you know, in our, in our types of jobs is like, I'm gonna make money and then I'll do good later. And I just think this, like one of the mindsets that if there's one thing I would speak to myself as a younger human, I would say like those are no longer separate. And there's so much power, when you realize how much power there is in conceptualizing that as you grow, you can do good and grow. It's not a zero sum game and it's not one off the other. And I just, I, I continue to feel that. I was at a conference, you know, a lot of CEO-ness uh, is doing these investor conferences. And I remember being in an investor conference very recently where somebody took me aside and said, you know, you're, ne you're never going to be one of us. You didn't go to Harvard or MIT or, or Stanford. You weren't a CEO of this other famous public company. And there's something so powerful to me about being an outsider um, that I really relish. Like I feel like a lot of the expectations that maybe on others who, who went to wonderful schools, I went to a great school, but I didn't go to the schools, or have all this other experience puts them in a place where those expectations mean they feel like they can't do good or bring novel ideas in. And I just, if there's something we can do to unlock that mindset and start that process early, um, you know, you talked about Mark doing that early in his business. I just think that's, that's where um, we really will see, see enduring success is when it's not after you've been successful, but it's, it's before. So I love the way in which you brought out another subtle bias. We've been talking about gender biases, we've been talking about race biases, we've been talking about class, but that bias that you brought up is also so pervasive and pernicious and can be an extremely, um, what I would say, powerful inhibitor for nurturing talent, the best talent, because of the ways in which this in-group favoritism plays out. And understanding that and identifying that is the first step. And Renee, in your first, uh, con uh, when you first started your comments, you, you invoked the term caste. You know, you said race, gender, class, caste. And one of the most interesting books that have recently come to the public conversation is Isabel Wilkerson's Caste, The Origin of Our Discontent. And this is such an interesting book because she speaks about those modern day caste protocols, which are less often about overt attacks or conscious hostility, but are dispiritingly hard to fight. They are, she writes, like the wind, powerful enough to knock you down, but invisible as they go about their work. So that's what Joshua, you've been talking about. No one speaks about, you know, looking at a resume and say, you don't belong to my same club, right? And those unconscious subtle biases are more hard to attack than the conscious biases of gender and race. And so what Rene and Amy and Joshua have said are so important. And to some extent, that's what Conrado said too, when he, you know, his own differences, his own uh, demographic disparities came to the forefront when he went to Spain. And here he was a male who thought he was in the dominant category, was then considered someone was diverse, a minority member. So I want to end by asking each of you, the four of you to speak very briefly about addressing those subtle and invisible biases that are pervasive and pernicious, but are what we have come to call in my class, a thousand paper cuts. You know, they are so subtle, so insidious that they are pinpricks. But in total, they constitute an enormous danger to the empowerment of the groups that have been historically underrepresented. So Amy, one minute. Great, thank you. Um, I think that this is incredibly important to focus on. We are focusing so much 
right now on getting diversity, but we're not focusing nearly enough in my mind about what we do once we have that diversity. And I've been really, really critical um, throughout my career of a number of programs I have seen that have been really, it, they're very well-meaning. And the idea is, you know, we'll bring women into the workforce or people from an un underrepresented, and we're going to give them special training to show them how to succeed, okay? Basically, a lot of what that is doing is showing you what has worked for hundreds of years in the workplace when people who did not look like you were there. And it gives you this idea that, um, at least, you know, speaking for women, um, that you need to fix women rather than you need to fix the workplace. And we've got to, it, it, we're not going to get any benefits. You know, we talked a little bit about group think. You're gonna have the same group think. If you invite everyone to the room, but you expect them to act the same way, look the same way, and spout the same opinions. So what we've got to focus on now is how do we get people to bring kind of their genuine selves, their type of leadership, their way they look, they stand, their height, everything about it, and make that truly part of what we're looking for in diversity and get those voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Brennan. Uh, one of the things that came to mind when you asked the question, Brigitte, is the implicit bias that all of us have. We can all go and take the tests and we can see where we're at and you can feel good about where you're at or you can feel like you have work to do. Um, but you're right, like it's there. We have to accept that, that that's just who humans are. And so from my perspective, how I've tried to combat that and make the company not have that is to lead the hiring practice based on values. So and I think in our last conversation, we talked a lot about the values that we have for the company, the foundational nature of those values, and how we make sure that that is the underlying glue that connects all of the employees. And that glue, it doesn't really matter where you're from or how much money you grew up with or whatnot. It just that glue becomes the foundation of having a culture that ends up meaning that the implicit biases are minimized as much as possible. Because that's just, I, I, I would like to think that we could all not have any biases, but uh, every study I read shows that everybody has some, and, and that's something that we just need to acknowledge and say, how do we have the best environment? To me, that's the values-based hiring. And if for any of your students out there, uh, make it the reverse, like ask the first question, what are the values of this organization that you're going to? Like, that's such an important thing, like to know, I, I talked about this, do investors ask that question? And one of the things I was happy with in the IPO shows, I did get asked that question. And so I think values-based hiring is something that can really help address any of these biases that we just talked about. So this is very important because I may not have told you this, but these conversations are being prepared as educational materials, which will be offered here in our school, but also at Berkeley, at Wellesley, at other schools, because we've had leaders from those institutions engaging in this conversation. So what you've just said about values will really resonate with a group of young leaders, not just here in this university, but around the United States and around the world, because we are going to develop educational materials that is first of its kind through conversations with leaders. So these are not only theoretical ideas on leadership, but these are real lived experiences of leaders who are at the helm of their corporations and their law firms. So Joshua, last words to you about values. I think value-driven businesses, purpose-driven businesses are now at the, uh, the cutting edge of our public conversation. So I want you to end this session by reflecting on what it means to have values on diversity and inclusion animating the purpose-driven leadership that you engage in. That's such a great question because I think that it's actually values and behaviors. Um, and, and for me, it's actually the behaviors. I, I, I feel, and I feel this, I'm going into a session uh, in an hour where I go talk to our new class of hires. Uh, and I love this. It's one of the sessions I love to do. And I say to them, I talk about values and then I say, and guess what? Every company is going to say the same thing. We're all transparent. We all have integrity. We're all good people. We all value diversity. Like it's not a, in the past, I think it may have been that those words separated you. I don't believe that that's a separation. It's actually how you live them and the behaviors that underline them and how much we as executives are hypocrites, right? I mean, if there's this line of hypocrisy, right? Where 
I value, um, you know, people having work-life balance, but I don't live it. Well, then I don't value it. I can say it, but I don't value it. If I go on holiday, am I texting and emailing you as a leader five times a day? If that's what I'm doing, then everything I said about valuing work-life balance is actually falsely incorrect because of the behavior that I exhibit. So I guess I, my, 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 my focus on this is actually, I, and I completely agree with Renee, it's about behavior, it's about values, but for me, it's actually the next level below. It's actually really hard to interview for on both sides. It's hard to interview a company as to whether they live by them. And it's really hard to interview an individual as to whether they live by them. It, it makes for a real asymmetry of information because everyone says the same thing. And I think as we have lost faith in, in our governments to some extent, unfortunately, because they've had hypocrisy, I'm also seeing us lose faith in our business leaders because of the hypocrisy that they have. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to hold ourselves to a standard um, that is extremely high because we are losing that credibility as leaders, particularly white male leaders. And that credibility should be lost based on everything we see. If you see the cover-ups and the statements, this is a group that overall shouldn't have a lot of trust. Thank you, Joshua. And I'm going to end with Greta Thunberg's words to your CEO, uh, Mark Benioff, Amy, when she said at uh, the World Economic Forum at a breakfast that was hosted by you, um, bringing together leading business, business thinkers, she said, we are facing an existential crisis, the biggest crisis humanity has faced. How you rise to that challenge will make all the difference. So thank you to all of you, leaders in business, thought leaders in reshaping our world for rising to this challenge and giving us lessons of wisdom on how others can join this vanguard of leadership. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you very much, Conrado. Thank you, Rene. Thank you, Joshua. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.